wireless technology began making great strides at the start of the last century. The world applauded the news that the notorious murderer Crippen had his flight to New York intercepted by a wireless message in 1910, and stories like this really cast the technology into the public eye. New achievements and the quick passage of time quickly left those pioneering days far behind, and by the 1930s, wireless telegraphy had come to play a great part in everyday life. In what seemed like a remarkable leap forward, wireless soon became regarded as a potentially practicable part of the regular equipment of the emergency services. It was becoming more widespread, and it was believed that it would soon secure a big future in police work. I've compiled a timeline of events which led to a groundbreaking regional police radio scheme centred around the city of Manchester that was run out of these dilapidated nondescript huts in a park on the edge of the city. Remarkably, wireless telegraphy was successfully applied by London Fire Brigade way back in June 1900, and it was believed to be the first instance in which wireless technology was used by the emergency services. A street station duty hut at the junction of Streatham High Road and Mitcham Lane acted as the watch room of the fire station further down Mitcham Lane, where the firemen and appliances were housed. Fire alarms were connected to an indicator board giving the names of the roads where alarms were situated. The calls were received at the hut and were transmitted by wireless telegraphy to the appliance station. The wireless was installed and maintained by the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company. It was no easy feat to transmit slowly in Morse code the name of the street where the fire alarm had been operated. Lightning, of course, played tricks with the wireless, and many false alarms were received on the set at the fire station. Upon the opening of a permanent fire station in 1904, the wireless apparatus was dismantled and the system discontinued. The first base to mobile system was rolled out in 1922 by the Metropolitan Police who installed receivers in some of their vehicles for the reception of Morse code transmissions from a control room. The first travelling wireless station, which was installed in a van, arrived at Scotland Yard on August 24th 1922. A number of detectives listened to a concert that was taking place at Marconi House. This concept was largely ignored by the rest of the country's police forces, and it wasn't until 1926 that they started to look at wireless more seriously, and more importantly, two-way systems. By 1932, Nottingham City Police had set up a system linking patrol cars with their headquarters, and Birmingham City Police rolled out their system the same year. Newcastle-upon-Tyne City Police joined the party in 1933, and in 1934, receivers tuned to Newcastle's police frequency were also installed in Gateshead Borough's single police car and in three belonging to Durham County Constabulary. Telephone links already existed between the headquarters of the three forces, so messages for the Durham or Gateshead vehicles would be passed verbally from the respective headquarters to the Newcastle operator, who then relayed them over telegraph in Morse code. The 1935 exhibition at Radio Olympia featured miniature receivers, which police officers could now carry with them. In these sets, an aluminium disc fixed to the crown of the officer's helmet would help him take messages through a pocket receiver while patrolling his beat. The Brighton Force purchased £700 worth of pocket receivers on the back of this exhibition. Another indication of what wireless was likely to play in the work of the up-to-date police force of the future was found in the announcement that a civilian who was an expert in wireless had been appointed with the rank of superintendent to take charge of a regional police wireless station. This and other developments left no doubt that wireless was going to be used more and more as one of the law's weapons against the enterprising modern criminal as well as in the more efficient performance of other police work. The civilian employed was a chap called Ian Douglas Octoloni, a 29-year-old wireless expert from Heswall. He was appointed to take charge of a new wireless station which had been established for police work by the Manchester City Police on August 15th 1935. He was given the rank of superintendent and was the first civilian to attain such a rank in the Manchester force without previous training, although his appointment was made however as a technical expert. Born in Gayton near Heswall, Ian was the youngest police superintendent in the country at the time of his appointment. Remarkably, he'd never held a position in the wireless industry, he was just an enthusiastic amateur and one of the most successful in the country. 
His interest in wireless dated back to his Reckon College days when he was in charge of the radio apparatus operated by the Officer Training Corps. He had a wireless transmitting station of his own, valued at about £600, the equivalent of £37,000 with today's inflation at his father's house in Heswall. After leaving college, he was in business with his father, but found time to continue his radio experiments. With my set, I can get in touch with any part of the world, he said. At times, I have not gone to bed for two or three nights in order that I might carry out experiments. His salary started at £450 with the usual increments and pension. The setting up in Manchester of a regional wireless transmitting station for police forces suggested by the Chief Constable was approved by the Watch Committee of Manchester City Council in mid-1935. Experimental tests were conducted by the Chief Constable of Manchester, Mr John Maxwell, prior to the station opening, and a demonstration at Heaton Park was attended by a number of police chiefs, including the Chief Constables of most of the neighbouring towns and representatives of two county authorities. The demonstration lasted for more than three hours, and constant communication was maintained by wireless with fast patrol cars from 10 to 20 miles away. Mr Maxwell in his report stated that all experiments were conducted on power supplied by accumulators and he anticipated that when a sufficient supply of power was available it would be possible to extend the scheme over a much wider area. Maxwell made successful tests from Heaton Park to Leeds 35 miles away and Doncaster 50 miles away. When the Duke of Kent visited Manchester, one of the police cars was sent out as a pilot for the party, and the observer in the car kept Maxwell posted by wireless so that he knew precisely where the Duke was at any moment of his tour. The test resulted in the overcoming of difficulties such as blind spots in the area. A motor car carrying a wireless expert made widening circles around Manchester daily. The expert began six miles away from Manchester, increasing his distance mile by mile, and went beyond a 40 mile radius without a failure. Tests were made from Nutsford, Macclesfield, Northwich, Warrington, St Helens, Bolton, Oldham, Wigan, Rochdale and Ashton. Fears that some of the Lancashire Mill and factory towns with their noisy electrical plant might have been a stumbling block proved to be groundless. It was hoped that it might be possible to establish a system of speedy communication with other regional schemes which had been planned so that police across a large area could work together in the detection of crime. Maxwell suggested that each force involved should provide at least one transmitter and receiver for one of the mobile units and that the other mobile units and the headquarters and divisional stations should be supplied with receivers only. At the conclusion of the demonstration in July 1935, the Chief Constable held a private conference at Heaton Hall. The conference between the Lancashire and Cheshire Police Authorities was held to discuss the practicability of establishing a regional scheme for wireless communication between the police within a radius of 20 or 30 miles of Manchester. The scheme received the approval of police authorities in Macclesfield, Stockport, Glossop, Hyde, Staley Bridge, Ashton, Wigan, Bolton and Oldham. It was hoped that Salford, Rochdale and the adjacent divisions in Lancashire and Cheshire would grant the necessary authority also. After three years of experimental work, the new wireless station was built here at Heaton Park. It sits in the highest point of the park overlooking the city. The installation of the wireless hut required the provision of electricity into the historic 18th century Heaton Hall for the first time, and the Manchester Parks Committee agreed to bear one third of the installation costs. A cable was run from near to the Middleton Road entrance to the park at Heaton Hall, then a spur was laid off towards the wireless station site, which was constructed on the high point close to the tennis courts and dower house. It began operating in early October 1935 and was designed to be used for maintaining contact with forces around the city of Manchester. In the beginning the station operated within a radius of 25 miles and the staff at the wireless station consisted of a sergeant and five constables, all of whom were transferred from other divisions in the force. At this time, all wireless messages were transmitted in Morse code, and a police code was devised which not only ensured secrecy, but reduced the time it took to transmit messages. This system, like most others at that time, involved one-way only telegraphy. The receivers consisted of two HF amplifiers, a detector and an LF amplifier. One two-way installation was made in the CID night squad van. On the site, a 140-foot mast was used to transmit. On the receiver side, there were two 75-foot wooden poles erected in front of the operations room which carried a dipole. 
By December 1935, five divisions, Oldham, Hyde, Macclesfield, Salford and Rochdale had all joined the scheme. Wireless equipment for the cooperating areas was made in the workshops at Heaton Park. In 1936, Octoloni asked Oswald B. Kellett if he would join Manchester City Police as he was having difficulty in the manufacture of the equipment and he only had policemen in his small team, some of whom were ex-wireless operators but none of them had experience in the building of apparatus. The work of building and supplying receivers and transmitters to various forces was underway. The wireless van, with its receiver and transmitter, was proving to be of the greatest value, not only in dealing with crime, but in providing communications, essentially making it a mobile police station. In April 1936, several members of the Burnley Watch Committee were present, alongside the Chief Constable Mr W Fairclough and Superintendent A B Edwards, at the police station where Ian Ortolone gave a demonstration of the transmission and reception of wireless messages in connection with the development of the police system at Heaton Park. Since opening Heaton Park, experiments proved it was possible to go further afield, so there was every possibility of additional forces covering a wider area coming into the scheme. By 1937, around 20 police forces, including the newly added Blackburn and Preston, were part of Maxwell and Octolonis Regional Wireless Scheme, which looked after an area in which 12 million people were concentrated. During 1937, the wireless hut at Heaton Park was the scene of a television world record. Ultra-short wavelengths allowed for television reception within a 30-mile circle of a transmitter. Manchester City Wireless reported a remarkable success by experts making experiments with a no-expenses spared Ferranti set. They received clear pictures and sound from the BBC's and the world's first ever live outside broadcast of motor racing. The race took place at the Crystal Palace in London, over 170 miles away. Following the success of the shared MF telegraphy schemes in cities such as Manchester, the Home Office came up with what was known as the Medium Frequency Regional Scheme, which consisted of a network of regional wireless stations covering the entire country, which was completed by 1942. By 1939, it was already clear that the future of police communications wouldn't utilise MF, but VHF systems. Experiments at Heaton Park in 1937 had demonstrated that despite widespread belief, VHF could be used successfully for base to mobile communications even in cities. When Ian Ortolone told a British radio manufacturing company's chief radio engineer that he'd been experimenting successfully with 60 and 78 MHz in Manchester, and also that it was likely that the band to eventually be allocated might be as high as 100 MHz, the engineer said, ridiculous, it can never work, especially in a city. What followed was a convoy journey to Heaton Park, with a special and successful VHF test laid on from the wireless station for the chairman and a sceptical chief radio engineer. During 1938, a VHF system was set up at Heaton Park to supplement the MF telegraph systems. The cars were fitted with national I-10 receivers, and the base station was a crystal-controlled helicrafter transmitter. In the following years, the UK's police forces migrated to VHF systems, and it would appear that the Manchester Police's regional scheme was moved from Heaton Park to Bootle Street Police Station in Jackson's Row. I found records of this dating back as far as 1935. Whether Heaton Park was used as a test and development site in conjunction with Bootle Street isn't clear. As for the pioneers involved, Ian Ortolone continued his career in the police as a superintendent. He was born on June 19th, 1906. By 1931, he was living at 14 Chapel Street in Liverpool. By the time he was appointed in his role within the police, he'd moved to Tandora, a house somewhere in Manchester which I couldn't trace. During the 1940s, he was chairman of Manchester and District Radio Society. He was a radio amateur, call sign G6OM. Their meetings were held monthly at the College of Technology on Sackville Street in Manchester. During the 1950s, he moved to Four Stand Close in Whitefield, Manchester. He continued his career with Greater Manchester Police, retired and passed away in February 1984 in Bangor, Wales at the age of 78. His call sign there was GW6OM. Oswald B. Kellett was born on June 20th, 1906. He retired on the 31st of January 1972 after 26 years as the regional wireless engineer at Marley Hill Depot. He was awarded the MBE for his services to communications. 
His amateur radio call sign was G5KL. He passed away over the summer of 1981 at the age of 75. Chief Constable Sir John Maxwell was much older than Ian Ortolone and Oswald B. Kellett. He was born on the 24th of December 1882. He joined the Manchester City Police Force in 1901 and served as Chief Constable from 1927 to November 1942. He died on the 14th of February 1968 at the age of 85. The next time you're in Heaton Park, take a look at the wooden huts. Most people would never know the pioneering radio history that took place here. <laughs> 